الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه من ولا Welcome everybody to the Safina Society Nothing But Facts live stream Another gorgeous day out in this great state of New Jersey The sun is out, the weather is, I would say, just barely crispy Okay, we had a great guest yesterday in Hamza Zortzitz And we talked about a lot of things today We're going to have another uh, great guest And that is Sheikh Abdullah Misra, who is an expert But first, can you believe this? Look at what I'm holding up here Are these people actually serious in this era that, and, and, and the way people live here and all the busyness, and they're going to drag me to court on February 13th at 8.45 a.m. because I possessed a goat for 24 hours in the town. You have got to be kidding me. Cannot believe this. Jeez. You are hereby notified that the court matters listed below has been rescheduled. All right. What is the court matter? Complaint number SC 202321255. Possession of goat. What? You call yourself, and there are pit bulls walking around. Oh, my gosh. It's, you know what bothered me is the waste of time. I cannot stand waste of time. 8.45, what is the February 13th? What is that? Isn't that like the day after the Super Bowl or something? February the 13th. And I'm supposed to remember this. That's a Tuesday. We're supposed to be streaming. Well, we're going to be streaming. And this thing is not on Zoom. I have to show up by order of the judge, James Hobich. No, what? That is a terrible name. You got to change. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> This is his name? I hope he doesn't see the stream, but, you, I mean, <laughs> that you can't be. It cannot be. It cannot be. <laughs> that cannot be his name. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No, you have got to seriously be kidding me. Change it. By Sharia, you would change your name. I mean, the kid's going to get made fun of. I mean, just, psh, I'm here trying to be a good, pious Muslim, and I can't stop laughing. What? Man. That is one of the worst. There are a lot of funny names out there. This one's not funny. This one is just straight up. Okay, prepare to be there from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Are you nuts? So I'm going to take the day off. I'm going to take the whole day to sit in a ridiculous courtroom. I charge my computer the night before and get to work and just be miserable all day. Sitting there in a courtroom. It shouldn't even be called court, this stuff. Any half-legal clerk could do this stuff. Wait, sorry, are they going to have, like, the goat in the other stand, like, in the courtroom? I'm going to tell them what Dr. <laughs> Harris Amin told me, okay? Ocean retina, if you want to get your eyes fixed. You come to Jersey, come to see inside a lot of get your eyes fixed. He said, listen, where's the goat? No body, no crime. Because that goat's dead. It's been slaughtered and eaten for eat. Yeah. When I took her back, I think it was a her or him. I can't even remember. It was, it was a her. When I took her back, okay, she was too skinny for Eid. It was going to be the next Eid. But he man managed to fatten her up enough. And someone bought her and, and slaughtered her and ate her for Eid. February 13th, 25 Kirkpatrick Street, New Brunswick. Please notify the court of any disability accommodation needs. No, I need anger management at this point, right? That's the, that's the need that I, accommodation that I need. Ridiculous. Come back from a wonderful Texas trip. To that on my nightstand. Texas was amazing. Dallas specifically, okay, was totally amazing. And there's there's two observations I made. And I think it's, it, you know, the first one is good. The second one could be good or not good depending on your, your, your depending on yourself. So 
The first one is that they have they have massage it and then they have cul de sac, cul de sac, cul de sac, cul de sac. A cul de sac for those in England, it's like a, a, basically a development made in a U, a U shaped development or a kidney shaped development. And there are homes on both sides of the road. So you drive down a road and there are homes on both sides. Not small, not big, right? But very nicely not done. Like new, new construction, beautiful brick designs. Very di- Everyone's got a different design. And you go around in a U like that, basically. And I think maybe the U meets again. So it's almost like a teardrop almost with homes on both sides. So maybe you got 30, 40 homes. So you got these like teardrop, 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 teardrop. And then you got the masjid. And I only saw one of these examples. There's probably two or three. And England has that, but not to this size, right? Not like I've seen Cricklewood Mosque, for example. If anyone's been to London, Cricklewood Mosque, it's at the end of a long road and it's at the end of the road. That's Cricklewood. Birmingham probably has that. But in any event, um, that to me was very impressive. And not only that, it's all intentional. It's all intentional. By the way, Sheikh Abdullah in? Is you're not here? Okay. It's all intentional. Like even the youth and the kids, they know that their parents moved there just for the sake of the Muslim school or the Muslim community or what have you. Houston had a. Houston is not like Dallas. I would say is here. Houston is a bit of a uh, less cosmopolitan city, but it has a massive Islamic population, Muslim population. Masajid, I've never seen the size of it here on the East Coast because they got so much land they don't know what to do with it. Okay. And so some of these masajid are simply massive. All I can tell you is like two basketball courts, huge musalla, um, recreation room, wedding wedding hall. One masjid even has a uh, miss the jama'a room in the masjid. Like the masjid has, it's like long like this, has men's side here, women's side here. And then there's a little room on the side if you miss the jama'a. Another room has like a... Uh, just like a glass wall and it's like soundproof and the babies and kids could go there and moms could go there and it's big glass so they could see the rest of the musalla. So they feel like they're not cloistered up in a closed room, right? And people love that. And so that part was extremely impressive. We did three events there. And by the way, guess who I met in the flesh? Madiki Click. Adi was there, uh, came down from Oklahoma. Okay. Oklahoma, where the wind, you know, comes blowing down the plains. You know, guys, you guys know that. Of course, you're not going to know that. The same gen- people who don't know what a trapper keeper is, he's not going to know that for sure. Well, when you play piano when you're young, that's the first song that they teach you how to play. Anyway, um, so we end up going. Uh, he comes down and he spends a day with us. We go to this one event, two events, three events. We had three events on Saturday. Every single one of them, was at least, I would say, 70 people minimum, if not to 200, 70 to 200 people, all different groups. Like, it wasn't the same group. And that's the vibe they get. There's, like, a lot of activity, tons of activity, right? Okay, tons of activity. Nonstop, it seems, activity. And you got some of the biggest names there. So on Sunday, we took a tour of Yaqeen, we took a tour of Qalam Institute, and Sheikh Hamza... Maqbul was there. So we did our tour together um, and we visited these institutions. We visited actually Yaqeen together. He had to leave and I visited. Also, Dar es Salaam Sheikh um, Mufti Azimuddin was there. We did an event for the youth and he likes to go late in the night. So it was like a midnight event. Okay. So that was all great. Now, what is the side of it that's a little different, I would say? I'm not going to say good or bad. Just an observation is that and I think there could be a lot of positives in this, right? In general, there's one kind of dean there, basically, right? Which is a very general, and I would even venture to say pretty open-minded, tabligh, you know, tabligh, light, uh, maybe diobandi a little bit type of, of vibe there. So in one sense, that's good because everyone's unified. Like there's not there. I don't. I didn't see that they're like hardcore communities like against each other in the way that more mature 
in 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 time, in terms of time, uh, communities. And I'm not saying mature me- mentally or emotionally. I'm saying mature in terms of time. This Dallas project is pretty new. What is it? Twenty years. People, not even that, been going there intentionally. All right, uh, to live there with them with the Muslim community. So, in that respect, I don't necessarily think that's totally a bad thing in the sense that at least people are unified. When I describe them, I'm not describing them with any criticism, just saying that that's the minhaj. Now, people, some people are brand new listeners and like, wait a second, isn't Islam Islam? Yeah, Islam is Islam on the things of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that are mentioned in the Quran and in the Hadith of the Messenger, peace be upon him, and repeated so many times and are crystal clear. That is where you could say Islam is Islam. So not everything human beings utter, even the Quran itself, which is the word of Allah, has layers of the t- or different types of verses, verses in which the meaning is crystal clear and it's oft repeated, verses in which it could be understood in two different ways. We call that vanni, right? Speculative. It could mean this. It could mean that, right? That's where human ijtihad by pious Muslim scholars comes into play. And we do hold that those opinions are semi-sacred. Semi-sacred meaning what? Meaning that it's rooted in the book and the sunnah, but it requires the thought of a human being. All right? So we could say that the word of God and his prophet is sacred text. The words of scholars interpreting those words, all right, we could say it's also semi-sacred. We're not going to say it's sacred. Right, but semi-sacred. So, uh, in that respect, there are multiple schools within the truth. So you have the one tranche no one can disagree with. That is that which has been repeated over and over and over, and is crystal clear. Is not up for discussion at all, and it's not up for discussion even if it wasn't repeated over and over. If it's one time it was recite, uh, it revealed in the Quran, and it's crystal clear, and there's no discussion about it the meaning cannot be interpreted away, then there's no discussion. And that's Islam, period, discussion over. Okay, then there is that other layer of hadiths, verses and hadiths, sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that could be interpreted either way. And then there's, on top of that, problems that didn't exist in the early era of Muslims. And scholars have to give rulings about those problems. They have to solve those problems. They have to. They don't have a choice. You, they must. If you're a scholar of Islam, you must. And there's a pro- fitna in your community. You must. The, the scholars must come up with a solution. Okay. And that's where you have now a, a fork in the road. of, And these are innovations. But they can be necessary innovation. What's the example of a necessary innovation that every Muslim observes today? Multiple mosques in one city. Okay. You shouldn't have Jummah. Except one Juma in the town. There should only be one Juma in every town. That's the rule of Islam. Why? Because that's how the Prophet lived. In Med- the city of Medina, there was one Juma prayer. As a result of that, the Sahaba took that as a, as a rule. That in the city, there should be one Juma prayer. The city should unify on one khutbah every Friday. Well, that's in the case where it's physically possible. As soon as the city now becomes so massive and so huge, you have to accommodate multiple jummas. That's a that's a necessary innovation. Okay? It's a necessary innovation. How about this? You cannot have multiple jama'ah, multiple jama'ah prayers in one mosque. For example, you can't have two dhuhrs. Hey, there's a dhuhr salah at one, and there's we're going to pray dhuhr again at two. The second imam, we got two imams. That's not allowed in Islam. We're not allowed to do that. Why? Because we only pray as the Prophet prayed. The Prophet never did that. The Prophet, in, when it comes to Salah, the Prophet clearly said, pray as you see me pray. So the methodology of learning how to pray is only from the Prophet, peace be upon him. And then comes, now imagine what about Juma? Juma is far more important, right? Juma is far more important. Jummah prayer is fard on, a, uh, on an adult male who's resident and praying in the jama'ah is sunnah. So how now, what now about the fatwa that we have multiple jummahs, khutbahs in one 
masjid. Multiple khutbas in one masjid every Friday. Why? Because the parking just won't allow for it. I don't know of a single masjid out there that is of a sizable, uh, in a sizable community that has one Jummah. In North Jersey and Patterson, they have four Jummah Salahs. The parking just won't allow for it otherwise. So that is a necessary innovation. What is a recommended innovation? An innovation we all observe as Muslims that has no basis in the action of the Prophet or the companions. And yet, everyone does it. Tarawih, starting the first night with Alif Lam Mim, Surah Al-Baqarah, and all the way we recite at the end, Surah Al-Nas. Why is it recommended? So that everyone can hear the Qur'an. Khitam of Qur'an is highly recommended to do. The Sahaba never did it. The second generation never did it. Who knows, maybe the fourth generation, fifth generation is the first generation of Muslims to do that. So when we talk about innovations, there are obligatory innovations, necessary innovations, permitted innovations, discouraged innovations, and forbidden innovations. And that is the philosophy of the great commander of right, forbidder of wrong, great scholar, Sultan Al-Ulama Izz ibn Abdus Salam, the Syrian scholar who was expelled from Syria by the governor because he forbid wrong. He was forbidding wrong. On some matters, he expelled him. He went to Egypt. Izz ibn Abdus Salam then is, the fir- is one of those who classified the innovation in this manner. The Hanabila never accepted it. So we have to be fair and say that there is another uh, view of this. So they, they, they don't accept it. And so how do then do they explain? They just have different terminology because they also recognize the necessity of the three things that I mentioned. Multiple jumas in the city, multiple khutbas in one masjid, and tarawih from khatsm, from fatiha tinas, or uh, baqra tinas, they also do this, and they recognize that. But they just term, term it differently. They give it different terms. I don't know what they call it. I'm not an expert when it comes to Hanbali uh, innovations in the Hanbali school. Okay. All right, where is our sheikh? Where's our guest? Yeah, give him a ring. No. All right, let's, in that case, one thing we didn't do for a long time is open QA. And uh, one of the things that I want to do in the future, okay, is I want to study the Schofield Bible, but I'm going to research it for a little bit. And you know what? It would be nice if we can get a uh, an expert on the Schofield Bible. We are on a Judaism, Israel, Zionism, you know, tear here. We're covering everything, it seems to me, right? And let me tell you something that just drives me nuts every time I think about this. What is the meaning of Israel? Okay. In Arabic, we consider the meaning to have been Abdullah. Asirullah. Asirullah. Right? This, the, the, the slave of Allah. But the he- in Hebrew or in Judaism, what is the meaning? Let me read it to you. I'll read it to you. I have it here. I mean, it's nothing complicated, but I, uh, let me give it to you. Unreal. The meaning, the very meaning that has penetrated then the ethic, the ethic of the Jew. Okay? All right. The biblical figure Jacob, Yaqub, Sayyidina Yaqub, a.s. Is also called is Israel. Now we have that in the Quran too, huh? Oh, Sheikh Abdullah, you're here. Uh, come on to the Zoom link. Yeah, check check the email. Come, on, we're waiting for you. Okay, Jacob is called Israel, the one who wrestled with God, according to Genesis thirty five ten. This is so important to understand the nature of this comb. Jacob, the head, the founder of this family, this group, this tribe, this religion, so-called wrestled with God, according to Genesis 35.10. As the children of Israel, the Jewish community 
has carried on this legacy of wrestling with God. Now you understand why God cannot just give an order and you just accept it. Didn't he split the Red Sea? Didn't he bring you miracles? Didn't he? Isn't he your God? No. So if God could put the phone from here to here, the Jewish ethic is to wrestle with God. Wait a second. Why there? Why not there? Okay. Why there and why not there? Rest, what does it mean to wrestle with God? Of course, in their belief in the Bible, it's like a mystical thing where God took a form and Jacob physically wrestled with God, okay? And that physical activity that Jacob did in this lie and this fabrication and this nonsense, it, it, it imprinted upon him and within him, the physical wrestling God imprinted within his DNA that we will always wrestle God, okay? So the Jewish community has carried on this legacy of wrestling with God, okay? How do you wrestle with God? You wrestle with God by arguing with his every commandment and disagreeing with his every creation. So if he created the sky blue, why blue? Why not? Let's make it another color. If he told you do this, do Sabbath on Friday or do your worship on Friday, okay? Now let's do it on Saturday. Okay. If he said don't uh, fish on, on Saturday, put the nets in on Friday. Let's try to always trick God. Let's try to always find a loophole. That is the meaning. Okay, And, and listen, no offense if somebody is of Jewish background. I'm reading your own websites. And that's the explanation of the Talmud, which is how far can we go in the law? The Torah is, of course, the holy book. The Talmud is essentially how far... Can we interpret things? And what conclusions can we come out? I'm reading from a Jewish website here. Sheikh Abdullah is going to reschedule. Okay, unfortunately, he's got to reschedule. No problem. So we're going to read here then about, about this history. Okay. Let's go to another, the Bible project. Another explanation of God Jacob wrestling with God. You have to understand now the origin of all this. Me Look, put, put down Israel wrestles with God. Okay. That's the title of the new stream. Okay. So, Salam, what's happening? Good. I'm on the stream. You're on live TV. Yeah. Jacob, here it is, Bible doc, BibleProject.com. This is, it just, it's one of those things that you get a tick when you hear it because it makes so little sense. It's this dumbest thing that you have ever seen, okay? Let me, let me put it this way, the concept of wrestling with God. Let's play, say I'm, we're playing chess. How do you win a game of chess? Right, well, well, we all know how do you win a game of chess. You got to move the pieces, or you got to move the little soldiers, the pawns, and then you move the pieces, and then you check the king. The king has nowhere to go. E any move he makes, he'll be eaten, okay? He'll be taken. So you got to slowly win the game that way, okay? Imagine now I tell you, you play chess with me like this. You have to defeat me. My way of winning is that I have a big screen, with a big green button. The moment I want to win, I hit the button and I win. Why would you play against me? Okay? Why would you play against me? That is the same meaning of wrestling with God. And then there's no button. There's just the word kun. What is the word kun for a new Muslim to understand? The word kun means be. Exist. Come into existence. It's two letters, kev and nun. Now, now notice, the word kun is also a means. God doesn't have to do this. Okay? 
But he's just telling us that when he wants something to come into existence, all that he has to say is be, and it is. He does not have to follow a process. The physical laws, cause and effect, do not apply to God. We have to follow processes. If I want to pick up the phone, I got to move my arm. I got to grasp with my finger. I got to lift with my muscles. Okay? My God doesn't have to do this. Okay? If, I, if Allah wanted this phone to levitate in the air, he'd just say be, and it is. And that's no big deal. That's not even surprising to us. Like when we see a miracle, the surprise should be that I've never seen anything like this before. Not how could this be? It could be very easily. Well, how could gravity be? Because Allah said, be in it is. He created gravity. And we're, the difference between gravity and a levitating phone is nothing other than one is the customary way of life. The other is new to us. We've never seen it before. Okay. And why did God create things this way? So that we don't go crazy. So that life can be predictable. So that we can manipulate things. Okay? Hey, assalamu alaikum. And you are? Zishan. Zishan. Who, whose friend are you? Oh, I just popped in? All right, good. We got a... a, a get, where are you from? Bro? No, sit, sit right here. Sit right here. East Brunswick. So you're just a listener who popped in. MashaAllah. Come on, take a seat. Make yourself comfortable. Zishan, so what do you tell us about yourself? I'm in telecom. Okay, mashallah, good. Mashallah. So a local brother coming in and uh, to listen in. Now listen to this. You wouldn't, this is the understanding we have of, of creation. There is no concept of a miracle, so to speak, the way the Christians have it. The Christians have it, the premise of the Christian belief is that the way things are now is absolute. We say it's not absolute. Gravity only exists because God wants it to exist. If he didn't want it to exist, it wouldn't exist. We call it mu'ajizat, karamat, and khawariq al-adat. What, what do these mean? A mu'ajiza is a way in which a prophet handcuffs his enemies. A prophet handcuffs his enemies and silences his enemies. That's a mu'ajiza. And it it's... It's a khariqa, I'm going to explain all these words. It's a khariqa with a claim of prophethood. It's something that it, uh, uh, is against the norms of things with the claim of prophethood. That's what we call a mu'ajizah. We shouldn't call it a miracle even. Because once you say miracle, you're accepting a Christian framework in which the way things are is absolute. We don't say it's absolute. It's just because Allah wants it to be. Okay. Yeah. It's what is what's the what's the word for this? Um, subhanallah. All right, anyway, skip skip my mind. It, it's just it's not absolute. It's just it's contingent. Just because Allah wants it to be that way. Imagine. Yeah, contingent is the word I was looking for. Hadith. So, uh, for the other word that you should know is karama. A karama is a khariqa, which is a change of the norms without the claim of prophethood. The karama comes to anybody who is a pious Muslim. The mu'ajiza only comes to prophets. Okay? The karama comes to regular, to, to pious Muslims. Without the, it's a change of the norm without the claim of prophethood. In contrast, the mu'ajiza is the same thing, but with the claim of prophethood. That's the only difference. Now there are high percentages. The high percentage, and there are adab. The high percentages and adab. Now, before I get to that, I'm going to explain to you what a khariqa means. A khariqa simply means a change of the norm. So what's the norm? The sun rises from the east. Right? Khariqa would be the sun rising from anywhere besides the east. What is the norm regarding the phone? If I drop it, it falls down to the ground. The khariqa would be that gravity stops. Right? That's a khariqa. The norm is water falls down. The khariqa is Moses split the sea. So the khariqa al-ada, what is the word khariqa al-ada? What is al-ada? The ada is the norm by which we live. The normal way we live. Okay? The normal laws that we expect to be in place. Gravity, right? Fire. We expect that if I throw something in the fire, it's going to burn. That's a norm. But Prophet Ibrahim was in the fire and didn't burn. Okay? So in our perspective, we don't have this concept of miracles. 
that has a premise that it's an unexplained, you know, way things are. No, it's a very simple explanation. Both the gravity and levitation are both simply because Allah said be and it is. Except one, he has established it as the law for our world. The norm, I should say. The norm for our world. And the other, it happens only a, a few times in history. Okay. How many times has a man been born to a woman without a father? One time and it'll never happen again. Okay. Why do we say it'll never happen again? Whenever a miracle, a, 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 a marjiza, a karama, something is spe specified to a specific person and Allah names the person, the scholars take from that that it's uniqueness. Now, rationally, could it happen? Yes. Rationally speaking. But by the Quran, it won't happen. Right? It could happen. Allah, There's nothing that stops Allah from doing this. There's nothing inconsistent with Allah creating another man from a woman without a father. It's rationally possible. But scripturally, Allah has told us he will not do it again. Okay, by that um, sort of method of naming Maryam and Isa, we gives the scholars a, a, a belief that it's restricted to them. Okay? You understand what rational versus scriptural means? There's a difference between rational and scriptural. Rational means it's not contradicting anything in our religion. But scriptural means he's, he, will, he will not do it because he chose not to do it. Okay, so what's an example of a rational impossibility? It's rationally inconceivable for God not to exist, right? Rationally inconceivable for Allah not to exist. It's rationally conceivable, it is possible, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put Iblis in paradise. Like there's nothing inconsistent with the nature of God to do that however in the quran he's told us he has informed us he will not do so he's informed us that iblis is cursed forever but rationally speak there's nothing inconsistent with god in the concept of putting uh, iblis in the parad in paradise but he's told us he won't do it so that's a difference between rational and scriptural when it comes to us as human beings when somebody says for example are you coming to the to my wedding all right i'm going to say no I can come to the wedding, but I choose not to. Okay, is there anything stopping you? No, I can come, but I just don't feel like coming, right? So that's an example of uh, the difference between ability to do something. Is it conceivable for me to come to the wedding? Yes, it's conceivable, but I choose not to. That's the difference when we say rationally conceivable or inconceivable and scripturally conceivable and inconceivable. You understand? Marjiza is only for prophets. Karama is for regular people. Neither of, both of them fall under the umbrella of khariq al ada that which goes against the norms of living, the norms of life, to the point that it surprises you, okay? That's what it is. So for us, none of this is actually a big deal. In in in, in sense that if you were to walk and see, uh, the, the reason the karama is loved, though, it's not, a, when I say it's not a big deal, no, that's don't get I have to specify that it's not a big deal in the respect of understanding how it happens it happens because Allah says kun, kun feku, that's it but it is a big deal in the sense that it also displays God's care for us a marjiza is a gift a karama is a gift there are a couple things attributes to each but they're not def definitions the attribute of a mu'ajiza is that a prophet can do it by himself. He can willfully do it. Okay? Like Jesus willfully cures the blind. In most cases, karama, is that's not the case. In most cases. In most cases, or in all cases, a mu'ajiza should be okay, talked about. Because it should point the people to believe in him as a prophet. And in most cases, a karama should not be talked about because humility is preferable for the wali. Okay? And it is not in our aqidah to believe that so-and-so is a wali. We have in our aqidah, aqidah means beliefs, to, to, uh, to believe in the concept of, of a wali. The word wali means someone who is extremely pious, that he is now afforded 
certain gifts from Allah. What are those gifts? He's protected. His prayers are answered. If you go against him, you are then Allah is going to punish you. Right? So that, if you go against him for purposes of belief, right? Not go against him for a valid reason. Like, what's a valid reason? A valid reason? A guy, I can believe someone is a wali, but if, for example, uh, we have a dispute, a business dispute, that I'm not going against him. That's a business dispute. I can take him to court, right? If I have a genuine reason to. Not personally attacking him. That's what I mean by going against him. A wali, the attribute of a wali is he is extremely pious, knowledgeable, has gone above and beyond until he's attained God's love. That does not mean he's sinless. Okay? And that's the concept. Now, you may see the signs of that in somebody, but it's never an obligation to say, he's a wali and I believe he's a wali. That's not your obligation. We don't have to do that, right? But we have signs so that we could follow them, keep their company, and benefit from them. So the karama goes to the wali, and the mu'ajiza goes to the prophet. Both of them uh, are khawariq adat, which is, this is not the norm. It's, it's something that is not the norm of life. That's the attribute, okay? Now listen to this. Listen to this tahrif, and this tahrif, you have to be educated. This tahrif will alter a person's mentality towards God, towards the law, towards authority, and towards reality. Okay? Because if you whatever your attitude is towards God, he's the ultimate authority. If you are willing to go against that authority, then you will easily go against any other authority. And that's why, if you notice in Roman history, every other Caesar and emperor is going insane, right? From the rebellions of the Jews, right? Well, we, yeah, they're going to rebel against you. You think they respect you? They don't even respect God, right? <laughs> why would they respect you? Secondly, what does it mean to rebel? The, the topic today, Sheikh Abdullah Misra, uh, he couldn't make it. Just another time we'll have him on. But the topic is now the concept of Jacob wrestling with God and the psychological, the cultural, spiritual implications of that belief. If your first generation believes that, okay, and it trickles down. And of course, we have to say that, that we have none of these beliefs. In fact, Israel, for in our understanding, is the submitted servant of Allah. They have altered it to be the one who wrestles with God. Jacob wouldn't receive God's blessing. He refused it. God blessed him with something. He refused it. What kind of warped thing is this? Right? God, therefore, wounds him. Okay? In the place that allowed him to generate his own blessing. So what? Like a farm or something? Jacob then, he, need, he wants a blessing now. So, so Jacob used to make his money somewhere or something. I don't know what they mean by that. We're going to go into the, the whole thing. I'm just reading the summary first. So he says, then God then takes away Jacob's own source of getting blessings. So he's so warped. Okay. Yeah. And then... Jacob, therefore, wrestles God so he could take the blessing away from him. Like, what if, if a child would not, would laugh at this? You can't wrestle God. As I said earlier, when you're dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to go against Allah. That means you have to beat me in chess. In order for me to win, I just have to hit a big red button. Like, why would you play against someone with those rules? Those are the rules of engagement when you deal with God, right? You can hit your head on the wall. You are never, ever going to defeat him. So why are you doing this? They have it as a mystical way in which God took a form and, they, and Jacob wrestled him. That's their thing. Yeah, anthropomorphizing God. Actually, he physically wrestled him against him. But when it comes down to actual reality of life, the concept of wrestling God ends up being... 
Every time God speaks, let's find a way around it. All right? And every time God creates, let's find a way to alter it. So God creates man and woman to be married. Let's find a way where um, man and man could be married. Right? Let's alter every creation. Let's uh, in, interpret away every law. Like there's some simple basic laws in the Bible that are interpreted away that we see every day in, in Jewish life. For example, God said a very a verse that they didn't understand why. We understand today why. The verse is very simple. It says, you know, like you should not, you should, you must leave, every farmer must leave a piece of land without farming it. Right? Leave a sliver of your land, O oh farmer, leave it empty. Okay, Every year after you harvest, you should leave a piece of land empty. Now, maybe they took it as, for example, a test from God. Because every farmer would want to farm the whole farm, right? And benefit from the whole farm. So you're saying, like, don't use some of the, the farm? So it's a test of God. It's a way to, uh, just a test of obedience. But, Fast forward in the world in the world that we know now, that's actually the way to save your farm. Because if you over farm, what happens? You can kill soil. The soil could become essentially depleted of nutrients. So every year, there is let's say you have seven plots. Every year you use six. And the next year, you rotate. What do they call it? Crop rotation. All right crop rotation so we now know that right but god is not bound he can test you he doesn't have to tell you the wisdom for everything you have to believe there's a great wisdom in this okay so we're doing an action they would be doing it for a thousand years not knowing why just because god said right so what do they do listen to this just listen to this talmudic way out around the law I'm also made of clay, right? The human being is made of soil. So therefore, me as a farmer, I'm going to leave some of my soil untouched. What does that mean? My hair. These parts of my hair, I won't touch them. And there, I fulfilled the law. And I'll, I'll farm my whole farm, but I'm created of soil too, right? Isn't Adam made of soil, Right? Made of, made, of, made of the clay of the earth, the, d the dirt of the earth, right? To use dirt in, in, in you know, it's, it's, it's technical sense, right? So therefore, I'm that too. Therefore, I'll farm with my whole farm. I'll farm out my whole farm. And I'll just grow out my locks, my hair, right? And that will replace leaving a piece of soil. Who are you fooling with this stuff? So wrestling against God means everything God commands, everything God creates, let's alter it, change it, let's get around it, okay? And that's where every single odd and bizarre law and expiation, and it, it, it comes from this concept, okay? For the rest of his life, Jacob walked with a limp because God wounded him. All right? That's how, that's God's treatment of a prophet? You got a very mean God. I'm sorry. That's why you're mean. Right? You have a very, now today, for example, a sister asked me a very good question. She said, if I have extremely extreme pain, like a migraine, and when I make sujud, I'm in extreme pain. I can sit down. Yes, you can sit down. But do I get more reward for doing it? And we say, no, in our religion, we don't hold that Allah Ta'ala rewards you for pain when, there's an, uh, when there is a uh, dispensation, a rukhsa. It's not our religion. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ Right? So we're not that kind of religion where God is looking and seeing that somebody put himself through pain now if pain came to you that's different that is from Allah like a, a, someone in battle and he gets injured in a certain way that's totally different alright 
Here, let's take a look what Tristan says. How can you say we are wise and we have the law of the Lord when actually lying, the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely? Totally true. Okay. The Jacob story, listen to this, bibleproject.com, Jewish website. And listen to how they speak about their prophet. The Jacob story is all about a guy. A guy. Yeah, that's a career ender if you're a sheikh. Imagine I have a, a sheikh so-and-so has a website. Like, he better make an excuse. He better say something like, oh, my my admin. You're autocorrect or admin or come come to a tech brother like you and, hey, get me out of this. This is a career ender. Right? <laughs> it was chat GPT. A guy who doesn't believe he's going to get God's blessing... So he spends his life hurting everyone around him? What is wrong with you? He tries to scheme and steal the blessing and abundance for himself instead of trusting that God is going to give it to him. Okay? Now, if that's your exemplar, that's your father, distrust of God, injuring people, and doing some brainless activity of fighting against reality. Reality in front of us is God's will. Wrestling God equals fighting reality. Wrestling God equals fighting God's law. If God has a law, let's find a way around it and still be clever, okay? The plot conflict of Jacob's story seems to stem from his disbelief in God's ability and willingness to give him the blessing he is promised before birth. So he spends his life hurting everyone around him. Instead of trusting God, he schemes and tries to steal the blessing himself. Okay, Jacob is the son God chooses, a direct contradiction to the ancient Near Eastern cultural practice of firstborn sons inheriting the father's wealth because Jacob was not the uh, firstborn son. Jacob's name, Yaqub, means the one who grabbed the heel. Okay. Uh, why? Because like his, I think it's something, I don't know. He had a twin brother named Rum or something and he grabbed his heel or something like that. Okay. Jacob is constantly trying to usurp his brother. You are usurpers. That's why. Right. Jacob then wrestles God for the blessing God intended for him all along. A summarizing picture of Jacob's life because Jacob won't receive God's blessing. God therefore wounds him in the place where he generated his own blessing, I guess his legs, because it said he walked with a limp. And here, Tim and John discuss this biblical narrative, and you believe this is a religion. That's why you behave this way. If that's your prophet, and that's what he did, okay? And they go back, and they say, oh, this is not the beginning. This is a pattern repeated through the Bible, Okay? Abraham fails to trust God's promise, blessing him a son, okay? So they abuse their servant, Hagar. What? Hagar and her son, Ismail. They don't teach this in comparative religion, I guarantee you that. They teach the sterilized version. Hagar and her son, Ismail, are sent away because Sarah gets jealous. Warped, I said, warped. Yes, monotheistic. Yes, that's they're good at. Monotheistic, no idols. But anthropomorphism and an absolute warping of the stories of prophets. We got to say this because this is what's been taught in every home for 5,000 years. And then you wonder why people behave a certain way. No respect for God. Why would you respect any other authority? Find a way around God. Find a way around every other authority. Usurp. God's blessing. Jacob, usurping God's blessing. Steal anything you want then. Instead of acting like God's chosen one, Abraham begins to curse people. Okay. So the pattern here, Abraham, Isaac, what, they're saying Isaac did this too? They're saying that Isaac did this too usurped yes oh sorry jacob is not the twin of room isaac is the twin of room Th what do they say about isaac they're twins 
Okay. Wait a second. Did I get it wrong? Yeah, I got it. I got it wrong. Uh, Jacob is the twin of room. Siblings, but then Isaac then has two kids, I twins. Isaac is a lot younger, but then Ismail, apparently according to them, yeah. was jealous of him or something. Yeah, from what I heard. that's what they said. That's a, t- a topic for another day. So Esau and Jacob are twins. In the Islamic one uh, version of the story, the Muslim version of the story, I guess they got different narrations from the Jews because they all come back to the Jews. But there is one version that the Muslims have accepted regarding Jacob and that he had a twin brother named Rum. Uh, let me just tell you one of the stories that we don't say this as sacred story, but we say this is what the Muslims have accepted of the Hebrew stories, is that Jacob and Esau... They were twins. Isaac was going to give the prophethood to Esau. Rum. The Arabs called him Rum. Uh, the mom preferred, she loved Yaqub. The father loved Rum. Ishaq loved the Rum. She, Isaac had gone blind at that time. And she says, and she, she feels that Isaac is not giving Yaqub is Haq is not giving Yaqub a fair chance. Okay? Again, I'm telling you the story that's told in Muslim books. That's accepted. It's acceptable. It's not saying it's true, but it's an acceptable story. And so Ishaq asks for a, a, a grilled sheep to be brought to him, and he tells this to Rum, not Yaqub. Rum then... Uh, the mother overhears this. She goes and she tells Yaqub, hurry up, get a sheep, slaughter it, cook it really well, present it to your father, Ishaq, maybe he'll make dua for you. So he does it quickly, and this is the lesson of somebody who does the good deed quickly rather than delays the good deed. So Rum goes, takes his sweet old time, right? And in the meantime, Yaqub comes, does it quickly because he wants his dad's dua. He puts it in front of him without saying anything. Again, I'm telling you a story that there is no authenticity to any of the Hebrew stories. But it's one of the Hebrew stories that has trickled into the books of Muslims and they've accepted it in the sense that there's nothing uh, scripturally inconceivable about it. That's it. Just a story. Do not take it as belief or not belief. But there are good lessons in it. Okay. And there are, the result is something that is, you'll see the result in a second. He then makes dua and he puts his hand on his head and he says, Allah, bless him with the prophethood. Yaqub receives the prophethood. He leaves. Some period of time later, Rum comes with a sheep, a roasted sheep. Yaqub, remember, uh, Ishaq about this, I mean, remember, he's blind. He says, what is this? He says, you asked for the sheep, Father. He said, didn't you bring the sheep before? And I made dua for you, and I bestowed the nubuwa on you. Remember, every dua of a prophet is accepted. There's no going back. He realizes what happened. Yaqub found out about it and did it before him. And he stole the prophethood. That's how Rum sees it. So Rum goes mad. He starts yelling. He starts shouting. Yaqub hears this. He runs for his life. And he goes and he seeks refuge in the next town over. And the next town over, he lives with them and he stays with them. Okay, for a while. Then the family and the tribe say, okay, well, let's calm this down. Because now for a period of uh, a time, Ishaq, uh, sorry, Yaq, uh, Rum is chasing Yaqub and trying to kill him. He's, he's in a rage for what he did. Finally, the tribe says, let's bring these two together and make peace. They bring those two people together, the, the two brothers together, and Yaqub says, I'm going to give your brother room. He says, I will give you, of course, and, and is saying you can't steal prophethood. Of course, this is why, you know, a lot of this stuff is, he perceived it that it was stolen from him. So he says, so the, the story goes like this. The story says that, Rum, uh, you will receive three prayers from me in compensation 
of missing out on what you expected to come to you, which is the Nubuwa? What are these three prayers? The first prayer is we will give you mulk. Your lineage, there will be kings on the earth. Number two. You all of your lineage will have beautiful, fair faces. Like you will have wonderful skin and good faces. You'll be handsome, essentially. And your women will be beautiful. Number three, you will outnumber. You will be of great numbers. Okay? And you will be the lords of your brother's progeny. Right? You will be in charge. Meanwhile, your brother will have prophethood but he will have small numbers and he will be subservient. So they will be subjugated to the monarchies of your, of room and you have to leave and he stays. So room packs his bag and he leaves and he goes and he settles in a new land past the Mediterranean sea. And there he lives and he becomes a soldier and he works and his progeny becomes soldiers of the king there until one day the king Many generations later, the king's son rapes the wife of a general, of a, a general from the lineage of Rum. And they have had enough with this, this king and these people. And because they're the army now, this tribe has become influential in the army. They conquer, and that's the beginning of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire is the dua of Ishaq for monarchy numbers fair faces and the dominion over yet jacob and his progeny so that's the explanation of the reality of the roman empire constantly being what it is and then dominating over the jews that is one of the stories that that they tell about jacob okay but what are we reading here we're reading different jewish websites on the con the jewish concepts of wrestling with God. Recently on my social media, I've been sharing my man. If I was to ever choose a rabbi, it's this guy, Yusuf Mizrachi, probably Mizrahi, Mizrahi. Yusuf Mizrahi, and why, why do I bring him up right now? Yusuf Mizrahi is, he's famous for a couple speeches that he gave, and he's probably given a debt in front of like 50 people in which he says, this is the law of God, whether we like it or not. We can't change God's law. Now, I'm looking at this and I'm like, and, and it's stuff that's all politically incorrect, right? He says, if Obama comes and he gives us a billion dollars and he says, don't touch the churches, we have to disown. We cannot accept it. We have to tear down the churches. Don't say, is this good for us or bad for us? It's God's law. We have to do it. Now, you know what I'm thinking to myself? That's not the Jewish ethic right that's the islamic ethic forget the law his attitude is one of submission right that's not the jewish ethic the jewish ethic is that's the law let's find a way around it and that's why i felt i relate to this guy this guy is an anomaly okay and okay and he gives all these speeches i don't know where he is but let me just play one for hey can i send it to you and you could put it up what if it's not from YouTube? Yeah, as long as um, you don't get any of that Yeah. All right, let me send you one of his. Okay. I'm just going to send you one of them. It's it's not from YouTube, so. And, and Omar will put it up, but this is what we're talking about here. Okay. His attitude to me is not an Islam, is not a Jewish attitude at all. Okay. This attitude of just pure submission, this is God's law discussion over, right? Because at the end of it, he says, I don't care if it's good for me or not for me. It's God's law. It's the Torah, the Torah right? And so I'm thinking, like, I respect it. I don't believe in the law that you're saying. I don't believe in that, right? But if that's your law, your attitude is the correct attitude to the law, right? Has, and that's why I tell people all the time, listen, before, when, I, when, when people start teaching me, asking questions in fiqh and stuff, right? And they start studying fiqh. I say to them, listen, before we even start studying, what's our attitude going to be here? 
number one, you assess the teacher and the school of thought that you plan on studying, right? And you, you obey it, you follow it because you have accepted it. Assess it quickly, assess it, oh, take your time, assess it firmly. That means this book, yes, it's a reliable book. This teacher is a reliable teacher. This school of thought is acceptable to me. I, not only acceptable, is worthy of following. Not only worthy, the most worthy of following. Okay? Once you make that exception, then don't, don't come in and, and, and be all lawyering with me and, 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 and conniving. Don't ask questions. If it's, it, you can ask why, but do not have a rebellious attitude. You chose the doctor, right? You chose the madhab. I chose the Hanafi madhab. The Hanafi madhab does not allow you to combine your salah for traveling. Right or wrong, Omar? Don't ask. Khalas. Accept it. You can ask what is the evidence, why? Accept it. You chose the madhab, accept it. Okay? Otherwise, you will lawyer yourself out of this religion. Okay? And your methodology will resemble Judaism and not Islam. Okay? That's how we operate. That's the way to be. That's the methodology, which is in complete contradiction to this Jewish concept here of wrestling with God. All right, let's get our let's get our man, our rabbi. And one of the things, the reason I love this is because the evangelical Christians cannot accept this, right? Why you evangelical Christians waving the flag of Israel when the Torah wants your churches burned? Hit it. And if the United States government would say, okay, okay, hey, you're becoming too fanatic, the government, too religious. We'll give you a billion dollar extra every year to the aid. Don't touch the churches. We're not allowed to listen to them. God comes before Obama and his friends. You understand? I'm telling you what the laws are. If we are strong enough to do it one day, I doubt it. All place in the world that we will occupy in a war, Milchemet Mitzvah, we go to a war, we occupy. Let's say we occupy Lebanon. And over there, there's idol worshipping places. We have the same obligation to destroy it. Why? Because now we live there. We occupy the place. We occupy the place. The Torah says, Don't leave anything, any idols among you. So every place that you live in, and now you the original owner of the place now, you the new owner, I should say, from now on, you have the same obligation to purify the place from all the idols. Because it's against the Torah. Remember, it's not to be what's an good for me or not. Even he went from original, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Listen, go again to your WhatsApp. Go again. Another one. Another one. Mam Salam, Ahmed Z. What's happening? Ryan, you've had a full house here. All right, let's hear this one. Listen to this. Fighting this war on behalf of all of us. Israel is fighting this war for you and me. One priest appeal to Israel. The, these are Hindus saying, we're with Israel. Now let's see what our man Yusuf Mizrahi is going to say. You have six billion idol worshippers who makes God angry every second of their life. Indian, Chinese, Japanese, uh, Tibet. Nepal, uh, 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 Thailand, uh, so many. India alone is 500 million. India, Hindus, Buddhists, and Christian, at least six, six and a half billion people are idol worshippers that according to the Torah, do not have the right to live. Idol worshipper, Goy, it's that penalty. Not only Jews, even a Goy who bow down to an idol, who, be who believe in JC, deserve Death penalty. All right, so there you go. Evangelicals, Hindus, BJP, Modi, all of you. You don't deserve to live according to the Torah. Okay? There you go. That's your boy. I want more Isaac Mizrahi. I want more. I want more of him. Yusuf Mizrahi. I want more of Yusuf Mizrahi. Okay? But I'm telling you that this is not the Jewish ethic. He is submitted to the law of his religion. You're not a real Jew. The right way to do it is to wrestle with God. Find a way around it. 
he's he's influenced by Muslims. Yeah. All right. Look at this. Bibleproject.com. Abraham is bad and occasionally acts like a snake. What? Okay. But the grandson of Abraham doesn't occasionally act like a snake. He's born treacherous. Okay. Lying. He is a liar. What if lying is his language from the womb? That's exactly what the story of Jacob is all about. Lying, lying, lying. His language is lying. So there are ways, reason people behave a certain way is because there's an ethic. There is a culture. There is a belief from the top that has trickled down for hundreds of years. Okay. All right. Jacob is known as the heel grabber. From the beginning, he tries to grab his brother's heel. When he was coming out of the womb, he grabbed his heel. Okay? And that is a symbolism for the reality that he repeatedly tries to usurp his brother Esau. From the beginning, Genesis 25. Okay? And then they cite the story that he brought the lamb to his father and took the prophethood, nabbed the prophethood. And so in your religion, that's something you could steal. So you stole everything from day one. It's just steal the prophethood, steal the land. No problem. Well, land is much less than Nabua. In your religion, your guy, your guy stole prophethood. Or you steal anything at this point. Later, Jacob and Rebekah scheme. Okay. To deceive Isaac. And prophets and Allah doesn't protect his prophets from being schemed against. God doesn't protect his prophets. I'm telling you this is. Let's get to Jacob wrestling and then we're going to wrap up for today. Enough uh, uh, of this of this trash. Okay. But it does. It is a very, very, very useful explanation. Of the behavior of a people. The mentality of a people. We are at wrestling with God, okay? We're wrestling with God. If you believe that you can wrestle with God, you will wrestle with any authority. And what is the meaning of wrestling with God? It is to go against his law in every way, shape, and form. And it is to go against reality. To constantly warp reality, okay? All right, so now let's, let's read this area. Ironically, the blessing that Jacob seals is one God destined for him all along. Jacob is either unaware of what God said about him or he can't believe it. So he spends all his gener energy to scheme. Hey, you used that word, not me. They used it, bibleproject.com. To scheme and seize Scheming and stealing. This is what you are saying about Jacob and you get upset when people say it about you? Hold on a second. You get upset. The Jews get upset when people call you schemers who stole land. But why is all your website and your Bible saying it about Jacob, your forefather, your progenitor? Jacob schemes and steals. The very thing God had promised him because he did not trust God. In part four, they study the conclusion. What is the end result? This is where we get to Jacob wrestling God. Okay. Again and again, Jacob acts like a snake. After he deceives Isaac with Rebekah, his wife, we never hear about Rebekah again. Okay. She doesn't receive much mention because she dies young. It's as if she has brought a curse upon herself because she set this plan in motion. Oh, wait, are you going to blame Rebecca? When what she thought was good in her eyes brings not blessing, but death. Oh, well, maybe this is where Shakespeare got Macbeth from. You know Macbeth? Macbeth, the king, he gets old, and Macbeth is a soldier, okay? And it seems, and, and, and the kings, the, the witches said, one day you'll be king, okay? And the king loves Macbeth, and he's going to make him king. So Macbeth's wife, yo, Shakespeare stole this. He completely nabbed it. 
He just changed the characters. Um, Macbeth then, he says, well, I'm going to be king anyway. So his wife says, you're going to be king anyway. Go kill the king. It's written, you're destined to be the king anyway, right? So go kill the king and become, become king yourself. Just like they're saying here, Rebecca is the one who instigated this. Uh, I don't know, not so much respect for Shakespeare anymore. He nabbed it. He stole it. It's the same exact concept, okay? And then he goes and he kills the king, and then he feels so guilty because he killed the king. Why does our TV keep going on and off for some reason? Yeah. All right, so Jacob and Rebecca. She brings a curse upon herself because she's the one who brought this all in motion. She thought it was good because it would bring the blessing, but in fact, it brings death. Okay. Okay. After this, Jacob enters a 20-year period of exile, leaving home to stay with his uncle Laban. I'm sorry, Rebecca seems to be the mom, not the, not the wife. Okay. Jacob then enters a 20-year period of exile, and he lives with Laban, his uncle. Jacob and Laban take turns deceiving each other. Jacob's, see these things, the, the reason is that while the scribes are writing, because they were deceivers, they painted their prophets as deceivers. That's probably the reality of what happened on the ground, okay? Jacob's flock continues to multiply, and he ends up with four wives and 12 sons. All of this is God, evidence of God's blessing. But his wives all hate each other, and so do his children. This is like... Uh, What's his name? Mar uh, is it not Mark Twain? Yeah, it's like not Mark Twain. Who's the guy who wrote The Raven? The guy who wrote The Raven? Edgar Allan Poe, and he wrote The Ushers. The Fall of the Ushers. All the kids hate each other. A guy with like multiple kids and wives, and they all hate each other. All right. And he's like this rich millionaire guy, but his curse is that all his kids... It, Subhanallah, you, you come here and all these authors, it turns out, ripping off the Bible, right? And these are the original fiction writers. This is all a bunch of fiction, okay? His family is divided and constantly hurts each other, and it all stems from Jacob's own failure to trust God. He remains determined to seize God's gift by force at the expense of others when God would have given it to him. Okay, now, if, if Allah guarantees you something, he guarantees you something, okay? Okay? And there's a chance to just take it. And you're rushing and you want it so badly. Just follow Allah's law and trust that he's going to give it to you in the right way. Okay? It's like some people, they always tell me, I had a dream I'm going to marry so-and-so. And then all of a sudden now he's dating her and stuff. Oh, I, I have a dream. It's from Allah. Okay, fine. It could be. First of all, the concept is not inconceivable. But the method, you have to follow God's law. And then you'll see if your dream is true or false. But to now go and break God's law because you believe that he's going to give it to you anyway, this is, it, that yes, you'll get it and it'll be cursed. Just because you get something, just because you get, just because Allah gives you something and promises you something doesn't mean it's he's promising you a blessing, right? He, he gives you a gift. It doesn't mean you're going to enjoy it. It could be a curse against you, like Edgar Allan Poe's The Usher, which seems to be inspired from this. It seems to be. Okay. At the end of this exile, Jacob prepares to encounter his brother Esau again. He stays up all night scheming. How many times is this Jewish website going to use? The, I don't know if it's Christian or Jewish, but you guys keep saying scheming. If someone said the Jew schemes, you get upset, right? Just like a Hindu. If a girl is born with six fingers, oh, Hindus, what do you do if a girl is born with six fingers? What do you do with that extra finger? Finger sticking out from here. What do you do with that extra finger? Wouldn't you get it surgically removed, right? Why do you believe in a God with a woman with nine arms? You wouldn't like it for yourself, right? I had extra finger. I'm not saying, you know, that they have a goddess who has nine arms, eight arms, four on each side, okay? So you wouldn't accept your own daughter to have an extra finger, let alone arm. So why do you believe that about your God? Now, if you wouldn't like something to be said about you and you say it about your God, probably or your prophet chances are that's the curse right you said it about your prophet now you are cursed that people say it about you now okay 
They said, God's hand is constrained. He's cheap. They said, God is stingy. All he's given us is men and selwa, which is the manna in English and the birds that they used to eat. He said, what is this? Two, one, the same meal every day, God's stingy. Where's the onions? Where's the, where's all the spices? Where are all, where's the garlic? Where are the legumes? To make this a well-rounded meal, right? So you said God is stingy? Well, guess what? غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَلُعِنُوا بِمَا قَالُوا You will be made to be stingy. You call God stingy? You will be made to be stingy and you will be cursed in the land because of what you said. Now, what does everyone say about you? And you don't like it? I'm not saying it. I'm just saying people say it, which is a fact. People say have all throughout time you're stingy and you love money, right? Hold on. You said that about God, didn't you? God is stingy. So, whoa, what a surprise. The boomerang has come back and people say it about us. You don't like it to say about you? Don't say it about God, okay? My friend said, hold on a second. In the Quran, the Bani Israel, they wanted the onions. They wanted the garlic. They wanted the legumes, right? But then when I go to the kosher aisle, food has no taste. Where is all the onions? Where is all the salt? Right? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, now listen to this. Here we go. He's scheming to meet his brother. And he sends his wives and his children ahead of him. Okay? In reverse order of importance. So they're like least important to the most important. Then, God is not approving of this behavior of Jacob. What does he do? He shows up. God takes a form and he shows up. And what does he do? He punches Jacob between the legs. So not only is God anthropomorphized, he's a cheap shotter. He gives him a cheap shot. He punches him in between the legs. And, as a re- and that is the source of his fruitfulness. I have 12 sons. Now he can't have any more kids. Okay. Oh, cheap shot. Yeah, cheap shot between the legs. Oh, okay. Punches him between the legs. No more kids. Can't have kids anymore. All right. Because Jacob wouldn't wait for God to give him the blessing, and he stole it. God therefore wounds him in the place that had allowed him to generate all of his beloved children. Therefore, Jacob becomes angry at God. And wrestles God. Okay? This is worse than the Greek stuff. Zeus. And that stuff. This is worse. Okay? Because that stuff, you know it's fiction. This, people actually hold it to be true. And it was the truth that become warped. For the rest of his life, Jacob walks with a limp as a result of God punching him in the private parts. Why would God need to punch in the first place? <laughs> See, being it is. He's a wounded chosen one, not unlike other wounded. Well, don't make him a victim. He's a wounded chosen one. He, he did it to himself, according to this, this if, if we accepted this you know, fake character. Not unlike other wounded chosen ones we will meet later in the story of the Bible, notably the suffering servant of Isaiah. Wait, wait a second. At the end of all this, we're supposed to have sympathy for Jacob because he got punished? Okay, The suffering servant is righteous and his wounds are received on behalf of the sins of others. But the message of Jacob's story is clear. God never forsakes his chosen one, even those who are less than righteous. All right, there is, this is all the tafsir, so the summary of Genesis, all right, up to chapter 27. And I would like to just summarize again. I can't stop saying the word warped. You are absolutely warped. And this belief is warped. And if you believe in this stuff, you are warped. Everything about you is warped. Okay. Okay. Hey, I'm just reading from a website. I never said anything to myself. Okay. Change the title. Put Jacob wrestles God. 
just so that we don't get flagged and schemed and whatever. <laughs> Why would you shut us up? I'm just reading from a website, right? I'm reading from a website that is, it seems, you know, it's authoritative, right? But it's not even, it, I don't even have to be authoritative because this story is well known if you know anything about the Bible. I have to go. It's picture day for the soccer team who won, who has won their last playoff game, Okay. All right, Christians believe this too. I mean, wrestling with God, as a result of wrestling with God, it's constantly nonstop. How come this? Why this? Why not this? You're going to die. Let's not submit to anything of the Bible, of the Torah, or of reality. Let's not submit to anything because it's wrestling God. So, okay, you're going to die soon. No, no, let's find a way around it. This is going to happen. Let's find a way around it. The kibbutz is just like so apparent. Huh? Because they've, they've equaled themselves with God. So the ego is just like... Yeah. You don't, there's no submission. And it, I, I've got to say it's a type of um, mental warpness because it's like I said earlier on this episode. If I play you in a game... Of, Ahmed, were you here earlier in this episode? That I, uh, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to play a game of chess. You have to play chess. You know how to play chess, Right? In order for me to win, there's a big button. If I want to win, I just press that button at any time. In the other means, in the meantime, we play chess. Would you play a game like that? Would you enter in a competition like that? I got to leave because this is um, beyond ridiculous. It's not monotheist. This is beyond kufr. Like, you know, beyond beef? <laughs> this is beyond kufr. This is not just kuf. Iblis, Iblis is turning red when he reads this stuff. Shamed. He's ashamed when he reads this stuff. This Panala. Wednesday du'a. I don't, I don't have time to do it. You all do it yourselves. I have to run. Everyone do the Wednesday du'a because Wednesday between Dohr and Asr is the time of Ijabat du'a. And let us just say one du'a for ourselves. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدْ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَبْ May Allah not deviate us after he's guided us. And we ask Allah to guide us to the path of his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let us live and die upon it in love of the ummah and in enmity to their enemies. And anyone who opposes Allah and his messenger and disrespects them and sought, seeks to fight the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let us live and die upon animosity against them and fighting them and guiding them too. May Allah make us guides for those people as everyone deserves a second chance. And a third and a fourth and a fifth, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put rahmah in our hearts and guide our hearts and make us humble followers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, followed by his sahaba and followed by the great imams who are known and trusted in their ijtihad and their fatwa and their madhahib. And may for everyone here who has a need, may Allah fulfill it. Everyone who has a sickness, may Allah cure it. Anyone who needs wealth, may Allah grant it to them. Anyone who is having a desire from their Lord, may Allah fulfill it for you today. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us an, a sign of ijaba. We ask Allah to protect our eyes, our ears, our tongues, our stomach, our hands, our feet, and our loins from the haram. We ask Allah to preserve us. And the min al so we re be preserved from committing kabair with these limbs. And if we commit any sagair, then may Allah forgive us and overlook our minor sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he gives nusra and success to ahl Palestine and to ahl Gaza. And we ask Allah to give defeat and destruction to every oppressor on the earth, whoever they may be. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this da'wah and let us always be in the nasiha of the Muslims and let us always be students of knowledge. Wa sallallahu wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbi wa sallam wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.